talk, what I propose to do is to give you first a brief introduction of the Sharma, the text. I'll read out some portions. Then we can move on to the PowerPoint where I would like to give you some information about the Kodabash library and then we can move on to the important copies of the Shana and also some of the illustrations that we have in those books because it is the miniatures which really make this collection so significant. So to begin with the Shana, I'll read out a couple of panels. Now the Shana or the Shahnami as the Iranians refer to God has been translated into the Book of Kings, that is the name that you usually find in the English text. This is considered among the classics of world literature. It is also the most valuable account about pre-Islamic Iran. It provides the versified account of kings from Kayumars, the primeval ancestor of all Iranians, down to the reign of Yazgar III, the, the last ruler of the Sasanic dynasty during whose reign the Muslim Arabs conquered Iran in the decisive battle of Nihavan fought in 641 Christian era. The dynasty however continued to linger on for over a decade after this battle. It may be noted here that this was the period when the Arabs extended control over both the Sassanid and Byzantine territories during the Caliphate of Hazrat Omar, the second Caliph. The account in the Shahnama is not purely historical, though the author would like us to believe so. In one of his verses, he asserts, to in the Rogo Fasana Mada, you do not consider this as falsehood or fiction. That is what he says. But scholars generally divide the work into two parts. The earliest is the mythical part, beginning with Kayumars and coming down to the era of the Hebrews. The chronology is not very clear about this early period. Then we have the second part, which is the legendary part, where the account of heroes like Afrasya, Rustam, and Sohra. These are quite familiar names in India also are mentioned. And then the third part is the historic part, which begins with the invasion of Alexander on Persia and continues further with the accession of Ardashi. Ardashi first was the founder of the Sasanid dynasty. And this dynasty ruled over Iran from 226 to 651 Christian. Now what makes the Shahnama even more important that it is considered by the Zoroastrians or the Parsis as a document of their national identity. I quote the observations of Prof. Dawa, an eminent scholar. He says, and I quote, Not only is the Shahnama a work on ancient history, but also the cultural treasure of the Parsis. It is at the same time, a record of their highest and best hopes, ideals and aspirations, a document describing their religious, political and social conditions, an authentic account of different parts of the Islamic world, and also a few hundred printed books. As you would recall, when the mass upsurge of 1857 took place, many houses of nobles, local rulers, and even the Mughal family, its treasures were plundered. And among those were hundreds and perhaps thousands of manuscripts, which were available for sale in the market. And people who were interested in these texts purchased them. For the Abash's father, Muhammad Baksh, with whom the story actually begins, was a small zamina in North Bihar. He had settled at Patna and he started collecting the old manuscripts. And he collected about 1400 manuscripts, with which he set up a modest personal library 
which was known as the Qutub Khan in Muhammadiyya after his name. Before his death, and that occurred in 1876, he directed Khudabash, the eldest son, to enrich the collection and to convert this into a public library. So this was done on 14th of January 1891. The library enjoys the status of being an institution of national importance and it serves as an autonomous organization under the Ministry of Culture from NFD. You can see some of the details. It has more than 21,000 manuscripts, mainly in Arabic, Turkey and Urdu, but also in Uzbek, Sanskrit and Hindi languages. It also has about 2.7 lakh books in different languages on a wide range of subjects. They are given yeah. Islamic studies, Indian religions, Sufism, Islamic and Indian history, Indian national movement, literature, the United System of Medicine, and social sciences also. Interestingly, when I was serving there, I also tried to develop a collection of books on gender and environment, keeping in view the recent requirements. Now, the distinct feature of this library is the collection of a very large number of Shahnama manuscripts. They are 28 in number and they contain 1039 miniatures or illustrated pages. What I mentioned before you is a figure based on the catalog compiled at the Cambridge University about the Shahnama. These are the details of the collection in different countries of the world. Sorry, it's rather small, you have a full view of it. The next one gives the details in different institutions in India. And the next one comes to the Kodamash There it is, 28 volumes, 1039 illustrations on the pages. Next please. So out of 92 that we have in India, 28 are at Kutabash Library. So almost two-thirds of the collection that we have in the country is stored at the Kutabash Library. Certainly the largest collection in the country. This is the rather old information. We had an exhibition of these manuscripts in 2010. And then there was a proposal with the collaboration of the Kutabash Culture House to get an album of the Shahnama printed taking certain representative samples from the different texts. Unfortunately, that has not been done so far. Although the work was approved by the Pope, there were certain technical problems regarding the collaboration effort, and therefore we could not go for the publication. I hope that it will be done. I mentioned that philosophy has had a very major impact. And you will notice that the popularity of the Shana, including the popularity in the medieval India, is testified by the very large number of copies of the Shana, which are available both in India and Pakistan and also in Bangladesh. So the entire subcontinent has a fairly rich collection. If I can go by the figures of the Cambridge catalog, more than 150 Jana have been worshipped in this subcontinent. In fact, in the medieval period, right from the Turkish to the Mughal rulers, Shahnameh was always looked upon as a source of inspiration. And many of the names of the heroes mentioned in the Shahnameh were borrowed by the Turkish sultans in India. For example, names like Kerimars or Kapabar. These were common names among the nobles and also the rulers of Delhi. The details of the court etiquette as given in the Shahnam were replicated by many rulers in India so as to glorify their court. And one very important name in this respect is that of Sultan Balban, who ruled in the later part of the 13th century. And he introduced customs which 
are considered to be un-Islamic but have their sanction in ancient Iran and in the Shahnama text, customs like prostration before the king or sajda and kissing the feet of the ruler and babos. So these influences that we notice are definitely coming from Shahnama. And again in the case of Balban, he tried to establish his ancestry with Afrasia, the mythical hero of the Shahnama. In the Mughal period, though the emphasis shifted slightly because the Mughals emphasized more on the Timurid and the Chinggisid legacy than on the Iranian legacy or the legacy of the Shahnameh for obvious reasons. Even in the military organization, they bought from Chinggis. But even then, the significance of the Shahnameh remained unchanged and almost every Mughal emperor, even Akbar who is said to be semi literate possessed several copies of the Shahnam and one copy which I will be sharing here with you belonged to the library of Shahnam. We will see some of their illustrations also a little later. Most of the copies that were available in medieval India had their origin in Iran and mainly from the Shiraz school of painting, even those that were prepared in India and they definitely show a difference in quality. We will try to compare a couple of such illustrations a little later. But most of the texts that we have were those that were prepared in Iran and the paintings show that. Uh, we also know that the Shahnameh was the most important text taught in the madrasas or in the centers of Persian learning. Even today, it is an integral part of the madrasa curriculum in Persian. It inspired poets writing in Urdu also to emulate the style. And the best such example, though I must say that it does not compare anywhere near the Shahnameh of philosophy, but the best example that we have in Urdu literature is the Shahnameh Islam, which was composed by Hafiz Jalandri in the pre independence days. Now, if we take up the texts that are preserved at the Dabash they mainly belong to the period between the 15th and the 18th centuries. So about 300 years, we have different copies. And that also shows in some way, one, the continuity of the tradition, and two, the impact of the earlier style on the subsequent ones. For convenience, I have categorized these collections, or rather these texts, under five texts. The first are those which are not only in a straight list, but profusely decorated. I prefer to describe them as the ornamental and illustrated copies. Then we have illustrated copies, but they are not so ornamental, they are not so decorated. So I call them simple illustrated copies. Then we have texts which are not illustrated. These are just specimens of calligraphy. And interestingly, we have one or two examples where the space has been left in the text for the painting, the text has been written, but somehow, for some reason or the other, the painting was not actually drawn. It's difficult to explain the reason for it, but this is the fact. Then we also have certain abstracts of the Shaman. As we noted, there are 60,000 verses. So obviously, many people prefer to have a, an average version, so abstracts are also there. And lastly, we have pictorial albums where some of the scenes from the Shaman have been portrayed, but without the text. Generally, you have a small insertion mentioning the event that is being portrayed, but the narrative is missing. So we will take up some of these. Can we ask you Now, this is the copy that I referred to. This is the one which comes from Shahnama's first attack. And you can have a look at the beautiful models. 
well decorated with designs that include floral designs and also designs of mythical elements. This portion at the top is technically known as the Sar Nama, Sar Nama or the headpiece. And generally, in the earlier period, manuscripts were written in the form of scrolls. So the opening part or the top of the scroll was the area where the maximum ornamentation was done. So that at the very first sight of the scroll or the text, you could have a, a, a very impressive visual impact. So even after the tradition changed and from the scrolls they went on to books, this tradition of decorating the top portion of the first page continued. And this is the example, one example. In the entire intricacy of the designs and the interplay of the golden and the blue colors, that is remarkable. This is just a scanned image and I must confess it is not a very good quality scan. But if you look at the original, you can really have a feeling of the intricacy of the decorative work that has been done. But this is transcribed in four vertical columns as you can see. The text from this end of the slide goes on to the next vertical line. With changes in the paragraphs at times, it, it, in the form of blocks that have been inserted. The calligraphy is very fine. I'm again sorry that we cannot have the details because they cannot be large. But the calligraphy is extremely delicate, extremely fine. Unfortunately, some portions of this manuscript have suffered in the passage of time and past, some patches have come up on the lower side of the way. We are trying our best, or at least when I go there, we are trying our best with the support of the National Mission for Manuscripts to preserve this. Another combined folio from the same book. 
you notice that the margin decorations are still the same. And this image portrays the arrival of the Queen of Sheba at the court of Samuel. Can we go to the next one? The images which we saw earlier were part of one text, the one that was in the possession of Shadow. Now we move on to another text. This is also fairly decorative, but it does not have the same quality as that of the imperial copy. This is the opening page. <coughs> These are decorative patterns along with certain verses and whispers. The lines that you notice in white are the text and they are surrounded by decorative margins. So you have the margins for the page. Here again you have two sets of margins, the inner one and the outer one. So this is the beginning. Instead of the sagnama, you have the opening page, so profit to the big page. So this is one step further from the stage of the shaft of the sagnama. Here is a two folio painting from the second copy. Again showing the code in attendance. I have generally chosen those uh, images which reflect the code scenes. And I have not gone into the battle scene that time, but we have one or two battle scenes also. We will come to that later. Generally, these are the two or three themes which have been portrayed either the scenes from the court, or the scenes from the battlefield, or scenes from hunting campaigns. These are the main ones. Now, of course, there are other two, but these are those the three that dominate. Another image, but from the same text, again showing the king being attended to by the nobles. What is particularly important here is the details on the canopy or the cover of the tent in which the king is sitting, and then the details of the trees that are shown in the distance. The work on the walls, the typical shape of the Islamic art or mehra that you see here at the entrance, again that reminds me that this particular arch is also something typical of the Buddhist art that we have in India. The Islamic art is generally circular at the top also, but the slight pointed curve, what we technically call the Oji curve, is a definite feature of the Buddhist art. Now it is difficult for me to explain here, I must confess, but this painting was drawn towards the 15th century when the Afghan rulers were ruling over India, and by that time the Islamic Mehra had already appeared in India. One can just uh, make a guess that this Oji girl was probably an impact of the Indian architectural features on the Sultanate school of painting. We know much about the impact that was there of the Rajput school or the Indian school on Mughal painting, but we have an earlier example where we see the Buddhist art figuring in a painting which was drawn even before the Mughal era. That is something of interest. Can we an identical scene with the difference that here we have a certain perspective. You can notice that the pictures in the background represent the interior part of the coat and those in the foreground or in the front, they indicate people standing outside. This thin division that you notice indicates that there are in fact two separate frames, one showing the interior of the coat the other showing the scene outside. So, though not really a three-dimensional perspective, but some sort of a perspective, some of a vertical perspective is there in the paintings from the three dimensions. And again, though it will appear a little shift, but we have the very fine details of the trees that are shown in the background. You can notice the different types, one, two, three, four, and the difference in the foliage or the leaves that have been shown. All these are very intricate works and they show the excellence of the artists of those days. This is a specimen of calligraphy. We 
don't have a spatial theory. But the calligraphy is extremely beautiful. We have the same pattern of vertical lines interspersed with designs which have vertical lines, uh, I'm sorry, which have diagonal lines, but they continue with the narrative. They don't break the narrative, there is no change of paragraph. But this box in the center of the page is there just to create a difference in the pattern. And this is another type of uh, an experiment in ornamental characters. At the end also you can notice how the line where the table of the inverted pattern. And I would just like to remind you that <coughs> since painting was considered an art that was not encouraged in Islam, of course practically it was, but theoretically it was not. So the emphasis was generally given on calligraphy for creating an ornamental effect. And later, as paintings also emerged as early as the days of the Umayyads, and in Iran it had an earlier one. Was adopted by the Muslim also. So both calligraphy, which represents the earlier attempt at decoration, and painting, which was assimilated later, both developed these decorative features. Now this is a copy which is still, uh, I would say, lower in range if we copy it with the earlier ones that we have been reviewing so far. These are the simple illustrated texts. They do not have that ornamentation, that elaborate decoration, which we notice in the case of the illustration of the first one. Now this is the scene depicting the hero Rustam killing the white woman or the sapeh chief. You have the horse of Rustam, the rush, standing behind. Now you can look at the tree shown here and you will notice that the leaves of the tree as shown here are rather ordinary as compared to the intricate designs that we saw in the earlier slides. The rocks have also not been sketched as well as they ought to have been. This copy probably would have belonged to one of the nobles who was certainly not a part of the imperial collection. Here is another copy which shows the execution of Afrasia. Here. here also you will notice that although the color of the page is slightly orangish, this is due to the passing of time, but the quality of the paper is almost the same as the one shown in the previous slide. The images are slightly better, for example, here in the green of the trees, the different trees shown in between, and the facial features also have been drawn more intricately as compared to the previous one that we saw. Next one. Another scene from the court, but this one showing the execution of a captive. This man with the sword is the executioner, this is the captive, the king is supervising the execution himself. Some of the details are mentioned here. But here again you will notice that the illustrations are the same. These are again calligraphic specimens with ornamental parts. Once again you have the decorated sarnama, the beginning of the text. At the foot of the text also you have a decorative box. And then you have almost four models. One, two, three and four. This was how, in the absence of illustrations, the calligraphists used decorative patterns on them to create an ornamental impact. Now this is one example that I was referring to earlier. We have the text written, but the space left for the painting is vacant. The text obviously was written first, and the work of the painter on the person who drew these sketches that came up later and in this case the work was perhaps left in the update. This is simple calligraphy, not very ornamental, but this shows that even ordinary persons 
We saw some of the copies that belong to the Imperial Library. We saw some of the copies that belong to the nobles. Even for the ordinary people, there were texts that were composed. And as I mentioned to you, it had a very profound impact with Chanakya on different sections of people. Here is one example where we notice that even ordinary people had copies of the Shahnama prepared for themselves. Ordinary, I mean people with some means. Of course, not the very ordinary people, but those who were literate and had some means, but were not as rich or as affluent as the king of the nobles. They also had some copies prepared for themselves. And this is one example. This is an abstract, an abridged version by a well known poet, Tabakkul Peek. The abstract of the Shahnama written by him is very widely known. We have one copy of this at the Islamic Library also, though this is a later copy and it belongs to the early 19th century. But this is, but this is again something very interesting. This is an average Persian text written by a person named Rama who belonged to the city of or the town of Hajipur, just to the north of Patna across the campus. Now, the fact that this abstract was being prepared at Hajipur, which once had been the center of the Afghan power in India in the days before Akbar, but thereafter, when Akbar transferred the capital to Patna, Hajipur suffered decline. But in a place like Hajipur, which was then not the center of political or cultural activities, a person was preparing, and that to a person who did not have Persian or Urdu as his mother tongue. He of course knew Persian, but that was not his mother tongue. So he was preparing an abstract at this rather obscure place. This again shows that the influence or the impact of the Shahnama had penetrated down even to the lower level, even in remote areas, even by people who were not speaking the language but had learned that language, they were also getting such texts prepared. Now this is a specimen from the Victorian album that I mentioned before. This is entitled the Barsuna and it contains certain episodes from the Shannon. This is an 18th century copy and what I would like to draw your attention to is the fact that this shows the impact of the European school of painting. If you look at the dress worn by the soldiers, the headgear that is worn by them, the type of saddle that is used, they are quite different from the ones that we notice in the earlier period. Even the facial features that you notice would remind you more of the nobles of the later period rather than the Mughal or the Turkish ones. So this shows the impact of the late, uh, during the later period of the 18th century, when the company school was also influencing the Mughal school of painting. But this is a different example where, again, you will notice that the battle scenes are more closer to the European pattern than the Indian or Iranian ones. And here you have the text also given. The, the, sort of narrating the episode, the battle that is being fought, the details of that battle. There are some comparisons that I mentioned to you here. This is from the imperial copy. And you can notice the richness of the quality of the imperial. I have tried to place two paintings of the same scene, one from a copy belonging to a noble and one belonging to the Indian Empire. And you can see the difference in the details. You look at the elephant shown here, the elephant that is being killed by a stone, and the elephant that is shown here. You can see the headgear of a stone and the one shown here. The background and there are the plain background over here. This is just to give you an idea of the difference in the quality of painting between those texts that formed part of the imperial library and those that belong to lesser persons.
again a similar comparison. The imperial copy is not so rich in details, but the artistic quality is better. The copy belonging to the Nun, both are from the same text that I showed you earlier. It has more rich details, but the quality of the painting, the facial expressions, the dress, etc., are definitely not of that higher quality as is shown. <coughs> Uh, the scene that we saw earlier, this one of Rustam telling the mic here, we have the same illustration here, the same here, but you will notice that all the three portray three different uh, versions of the same event. This is interesting and this shows the amount of imagination that the artist put in, in his decorations. The text is the same. There would be minor variations of one, of a few verses here and there, but the text generally does not differ much from the original. We have texts of the Shahnama which contain only 50,000 verses. We have texts which have the full 60,000 verses. We have the average version also versified which had even less than a number of verses. But the narrative is the same. Here what we notice is that the same scene which has been mentioned in the text, that has been portrayed by the painter or the artist in different ways and this shows that in the case of the painting at least the artist was very much at liberty to draw a particular scene or a particular episode in the way he thought of it. Paintings were not invariably the copying of one or the other and that makes the miniatures of the Shana so rich and so quiet. Now these are the Urmans, technically the tiny pages. I have chosen two days before you. This is the first one. And here is the reason for the choice is the elaborate decoration of the markets. As I said earlier also, they scan the model for very high quality. But even then, I think you can have some idea of the interplay of different colors. <coughs> White, the blue, the pinkish, orange. And the delicate work, very intricate work that goes in making these delicate pages. It's a different example, but more rich as far as the margins are concerned and more elaborate as far as the calligraphy is concerned. Can we just revert back to the earlier pages? You can contrast this with the one that we just saw. And you will have a feeling of the comparative difference between the two in terms of the richness and the fine workmanship. So, this was what I wanted to share with you about the collection that we have at the Dawash Library with the Shyamalai manuscripts. I hope I was able to convey to you some of the features of this collection and the variety of the miniatures that we have. These are just a few selected samples. Come to the library if you take a look at the texts that are preserved there. You will have the advantage both of seeing more such specimens, having a better idea of the broader range than the one you just saw. And you will also be able to relish the beauty of the original miniature as compared to the scanning. Thank you very much.